Okay, I think we've gone live. Great. So, um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're just going to take a few minutes to just uh, wait for everybody to, to come into the room um, and then we'll kick off another session of, of Provenance Live. So while we wait for everybody, please do um, all come in and introduce yourselves and where you're from in the chat. Um, and also we've got a bit of a que question, crazy question for you today, which is uh, if you could let us know something you've done in lockdown that surprised you the most, um, we would love to, love to hear your tales. And then we'll, we'll be getting started in a couple of minutes. Actually, maybe you guys should tell me, Amy, Kavita, <laughs> tell me something in lockdown? Lo in lo what in lockdown has surprised you the most? <laughs> oh, the fact that I could mobilize uh, uh, with, with just a couple of my staff under the strict lockdown and deliver around 12 tons of now 15 tons of food in sealed containment areas with like 10, 15 deaths a day. Uh, it wow. just surprised me that the kind of, you know, um, when you really want to do something, there is no way, you know, even the lock, COVID lockdown doesn't stop you. You go out there and do it. That, that surprised me the most. I never thought I'd be able to, you know, it was just a thought and, and it's actually happened. It's amazing. Yes. Well done. Amy, how about you? Any surprises in lockdown? I did not follow that at all. <laughs> 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 at all. Um, mine feel a lot more human i'm not superhuman i'm very not superhuman yeah um gosh i you know probably mine would be that i've turned into a pretty avid rugby player every afternoon oh. because wow. i have two i know uh because i have two sons who are really into rugby so i'm learning all of the rules and regulations and tackling and awesome. amazing yeah oh <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for sharing. Right. Well, let's let's kick off because we've got a, a half an hour session today. I'm so excited to welcome everybody for another edition of Provenance Live. Um, so this is where we bring together industry experts and companies that we love to discuss the issues that matter most to the Provenance community. So we're hosting these um, every two weeks, same day, same time. Um, so to kick us off, I, I'm, I'm Jesse. I'm the founder of Provenance. Um, I'm personally very passionate about enabling a world where information about the impact of the products we buy is transparent so that we can all um, understand more about the, the great true stories behind the, the products we buy. Um, so yeah, today Provenance is, um, you know, le leading the charge on this very much from a kind of consulting and, and software point of view, um, hoping to create a future where, where products all come with that information about where they come from, who made them, from what. But I am super honoured today to be joined by two fellow founders, um, thank you so much, Amy and Kavita, for joining me. Um, so in terms of the format for today, um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to both of our amazing guests. Uh, and then we'll get started with a few questions. Um, and then towards the end of the session, we'll, we'll take a few questions from the audience. However, if you have a question now, please do throw it into the, uh, into the chat box because we'd love to accumulate some so we can uh, get ready towards the end. So don't be shy. Obviously, we're at a crucial time to be discussing um, social impact in product supply chains. I think COVID-19 COVID has really shown the fragility of our global interconnected networks and how reliant we are um, on so many people from all over the planet. So it feels like a very uh, right time to be talking about this uh, discussion topic. And really, that is the heart of our discussion today, is about the people behind our products, those in the supply chains that are working to collect those ingredients that sometimes seem very far away from the bottle you have on your shelf. But with no further ado, let me introduce our, our, our amazing founder guest. So Amy is the founder of Sana Jardin, a socially conscious luxury fragrance company. Amy started her career as a social worker, but realized early on that the people she was dealing with in these very tough situations really needed an economic opportunity. We're really excited to chat with her about the kind of beyond sustainability model that she's applied to her business and how she's empowering the women who harvest the ingredients um, that really make up her gorgeous fragrances. Kavita is the founder of Pura, an ethical skincare brand that works with wild ingredients and indigenous groups to empower women uh, who are harvesting the bot botanicals she uses. So she quit her career as a lawyer to pursue Ayurvedic wellness and has created a skincare line around this. So she lives usually in Hong Kong, but currently is stuck in India due to the COVID crisis. 
So we're very interested to hear how she's uh, leaning more into the social NGO side of her initiatives to support women in the community. So thank you so much. Welcome, both of you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so Great. much. Well, let's jump in. I can't wait to hear more about your businesses. So let's start with that founder moment, shall we? Um, <laughs> when, were you, when you were crazy enough to think, I know, I'm going to start a business. Um, I'd love to hear just briefly, you know, when did you first start the, the company um, and what inspired you to build a brand putting people first? Um, Amy, do you want to kick us off? Sure. So, um, I'm going to try to make this as succinct as possible. It never ends up being succinct. Um, so really the inspiration for the brand was, um, I think, a culmination of my life's work. So as you mentioned, I started in the field of direct practice social work. Um, and then I ended up for about 20 years working for different foundations to address issues of economic inequality. Um, so I worked for the Robin Hood Foundation in New York. Uh, I was a pro bono advisor for President Clinton's foundation. And then right before I started Sana Jardin, I was the uh, governing trustee of the Shree Blair Foundation to support women entrepreneurs. Wow. And through all of that, I realized that actually business and harnessing the power of commerce is really the next iteration of social change and not traditional philanthropy. <clears throat> At the same time, um, I've always loved perfume. I've loved perfume since I was a little girl, and I spend a lot of time in, in Morocco. Uh, and I am involved with a couple of organizations that work to make the supply chain and fashion more ethical and more transparent. And I thought, you know, why not, if we can do this in fashion, why not do something like this in beauty? And being a perfume lover, um, I could never find what I wanted on the market. I always say that. I would go from the souk in Oman to Barney's in LA and I couldn't find what I liked. And so all of these ideas and all of these threads just kind of were brewing in my head. And, um, and I was also attracted to the healing power of essential oils, you know, and Absolutely. plants and flowers and perfume. So in 2016, I started really working on the idea in earnest. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2017, we launched. Amazing. Wow. Welcome. Congratulations, I mean, huge, huge success. Getting a product to market, getting it from idea and seeing a gap and discover to, to actually getting something on shelf is a huge, huge achievement. Kavita, love to hear a bit more about your backstory and when you started. So, um, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, I'm a lawyer and um, sometime in 2010, I decided I wanted to hang up my boots. Um, uh, I uh, was an accidental lawyer, I think. Uh, I am a reluctant entrepreneur, you know. I am not, you know, the business side of, of what I do doesn't really fascinate me. But uh, I think ever since I've been little, I have been very um, um, uh, connected to, you know, uh, whether it is social justice, street, uh, you know, uh, uh, street children, or uh, whether it was to do with... Um, because I was a lawyer, being a women's rights activist, somehow I've always been involved with, you know, uh, community and social work. And so uh, I decided, you know, I had enough of doing corporate law and I knew I wanted to come back to India. I wanted to come back to my roots. I wanted to, I didn't want to set up a charity because uh, to me, charity, uh, though, uh, you know, you need charitable foundations to do a lot of that good work, like hospitals and schools schools but for me what really uh, i subscribe to the thing of a social enterprise to the model of a social enterprise where you absolutely know, yeah uh, can give women you know um income independence and yes. um, mm. especially in the context of india you know when a woman has income of course in mm -hmm. education um and education so that she can be become income independent uh and i have seen that change myself you know over the course of in 2011 i started launched in 2014 and, you know, I've spent uh, months and months and months all alone by myself in the mountains, in the Himalayan mountains, in the villages. Wow. <laughs> you know, sleeping at different places, sleeping in different places every night, all alone <laughs> in the villages with the women. And I have seen the change, you know, and I've been... Amazing. Happy. Yeah. What economic empowerment can do, right? I mean, yeah. I think we're all, all in agreement and shared on the power of, of business as a force for good and how such a powerful model that, that can be to to um to en enable change 
Um, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your kind of your founding stories. Um, I'm conscious we've, we've got often quite get quite a few um, kind of early stage companies or even aspiring founders join these calls. And I just wondered if um, I guess thinking back to those, those moments when you first started, like if you were a brand, you know, a brand that either exists now or thinking about building a brand that wants to go kind of, I guess, over and above what today is sadly the norm, which is to not really act proactively support um, workers deep in your supply chain that you're often you know disconnected from as a um, as, a, as an end brand um, and yeah if you wanted to, to essentially bring social impact into your brand and, and help support kind of the, those workers and the wider community like how how would you go about getting started like how do you kick that off to me, Amy, go yeah, I'm a very very I'm sort of um, nerdily passionate about looking at supply chain waste and identifying where the waste is and being creative about um, giving that back to the people at the base of the supply chain so they can work to sell it. So for example, with and, and I think that that model can be applied in any industry. Um, yeah. We call that actually the beyond sustainability model because I think, you know, when I was starting the brand, my understanding of the definition of sustainability was to pay people fair wages and leave a net neutral impact on the environment and i felt like oh, you know it's 20 it's 2017 we can do better than that we can actually really help people to flourish yeah. and so in terms of what we do um we take the waste product from perfume production we upcycle that waste and then we give that to the women so that they can sell it and we've trained them to be their own micro entrepreneurs and i can go into the details of that later on this call but in general if i was starting if i was starting a brand right now mm -hmm. um i would very much focus on on upcycling waste agreed huge huge problem kavita what about you starting out again or had an existing brand that hadn't prioritized this like how would you get started you know, I honestly don't have an answer to that because it just, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't have any model. I didn't know what I really was going to do. I just landed here and I found my way. Yeah. Um, so well, it's, it's quite an emotional, organic that you have been I mean, being an yes. entrepreneur or focusing yourself as a, as a company. Like it's, it's not that rational, right? You, it's a, it's yeah. an empathetic, <laughs> I want to help people yes. like, you know, like, I, I think that's the, well, for me, it's like the overriding feeling is that feeling yeah. of empathy and wanting to make change right. um, rather than a calculated, like, I've got to do this, then this. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have a plan. I didn't have any strategy. I just landed and I said, I didn't know, you know, so it's not like I had this epiphany. Or I said, I'll start a skincare brand or whatever. Mm. My, my whole thing was I wanted to start a social enterprise, not a charity. I wanted yeah. to work with women. I wanted to be connected to the soil. It had to be something to do with the soil. And then it just all kind of evolved and happened. And I didn't know a single person. And yeah. I, just, I just, you know, a big leap of faith. And then here I am. No, <laughs> I, totally, I totally get it. If you're super passionate about something, you see a problem or an opportunity, you just go for it. You have to take a bit by, I mean, because if you did try and map out the entire mountain, probably none of us would have ever even bothered because right? it is it's a, it's a it's a hard thing to do like for sure so uh, that makes a lot of sense but then i guess let, let's talk about climbing the mountain which is creating social impact and enabling uh you know i mean what you know what there's over one billion workers today earning less than a pound uh you know like every day and it's it's so it's very clear like the absolutely huge injustice that's going on around the world and yeah. and often many of those people are behind the products that, that we're buying um in everywhere from supermarket to your online well more, more usually now your online store um but i oh, okay. I'd, love to think, I'd love to think a little bit about the how we measure social impact and i think this is such a hard thing to talk about because it's difficult to quantify um but i'd love to hear a little bit about how you guys are, are thinking about measuring that impact you are having um, on those workers in your supply chain so I, I mean so for me uh like i said you know i have no uh strategies and plans or anything like that it's very organic and i don't have investors i'm self-funded so i'm no one to report to i do what i please and how i please Thank you. And I'm <laughs> And I'm led by the people and the planet and not by profit. Um, right. In fact, I 
actually reject investors because, um, uh, you know, I'm not driven by shareholder value. But that said, uh, measuring social impa impact for me, for example, I'm sitting in the mountains and uh, one of our self-help group ladies is pregnant for the third time. And I'll sit over a cup of tea and ask her, so what does your family think? You know, she's had two daughters. And because she's income independent, she's like, I don't care what my family thinks. Uh, if it's a daughter, I'm very happy because I can support my three children. Um, I'm financially independent. And uh, so to me, that is social impact that you create by giving yeah. them, you know, uh, uh, a livelihood. Absolutely. Support. You know, or well, for there's... example, migration into cities, you know, around 25, this is eight years ago, 25% of the men in, a, in one of the states in the Himalayas uh, are moving from their rural uh, uh, places into cities for jobs so that yeah. makes mm -hmm. the women become the caregivers and income mm -hmm. you know uh, supporters mm -hmm. so um when you give them when you bring like you know swami vivekananda who was an indian guru he said if the child can't come to the school bring the school to the child so you can't have people coming out of the eco habitats and eco spheres into uh, assembly line work you know you need to bring yeah. work to them and mm -hmm. that's what drives my passion, you know, going into the most remotest areas and being able to give them uh, a means of livelihood. So that's what you I mean, for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I really, I completely agree with you. It's, yeah, that empowering those in their own communities. And I think there's also a lot of uh, great research on, you know, the, the, the proven social impact of empowering women, particularly mm -hmm. in remote communities and what that can, can do for growing education, empowering further women, et cetera. Um, I think the statistic, I think it's something like for when women earn money, they give 90% back to their families and their communities in low income, um, you know, rural, rural communities in developing countries. And I think it's 50% that men, that men give back. So I think, you know, I'm sure we're all in agreement <laughs> Yeah, that um, empowering women economically is such a, such a essential tool for change. Um, and I agree with what you're saying very much to Jesse about empathy and, you know, sort of a, creating something from a place of empathy and, um, and understanding that we are all the same. And um, Kavita, I'm sure you feel the same way, where if, if we have an opportunity to be of service, it's, it's you know, we feel bound yes. to take advantage of, of, of those gifts and those tools that we can use yes. to be of service. Um, so, in terms of measuring social impact, for Sana Jordan, um, so we meet four of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, mm -hmm. We started when we first launched our program, and I, I think maybe now is a good opportunity to talk specifically about what Sana Jordan, the Beyond Sustainability model that we do. So, yeah. on one hand, uh, you know, we are a luxury perfume company, and we're sold, our perfumes are sold in... Uh, many of them are closed right now, but about 100 retailers around the world, um, like net a and Harrods. So we're just like any perfume on the market. Um, but what we do that's different is the women in Morocco, when they are harvesting the flowers, so they only have access to seasonal work. They live in a rural community. They don't have any job skills. They have not been educated, and so they only have access to work during the harvest season. So that's about two times a year. Mm -hmm. So what we do is, so they harvest the orange blossom, they harvest the rose, they harvest the jasmine. That goes into a distillation machine, and the mm -hmm. output of that is essential oil that a perfume company like ours buys. But then there's two other outputs that are waste products. So one is orange blossom water, and then yeah. the other one is scented candle wax. And so uh, we came in... A few years back with Nest, a New York-based nonprofit, and uh, we were on the ground with them, training them how to make these candles, market them, price them, train them in financial literacy, sales, give them access to the distribution channels, and then also the same for the orange blossom water. So, yeah. so you know, they, they, their income has gone up, uh, obviously, because now they're their own micro entrepreneurs. We are now starting to dive deeper into that and start to, you know, really develop a list of KPIs that they can, some of them are, you know, uh, we have someone on the ground, a former Peace Corps volunteer who manages the, the women's cooperative. And so she's at the moment now actually working with them to develop the KPIs, you know, their increase in confidence, 
increase um, to really quantify, you know, their increase in earned income over the mm -hmm. year. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, can you, yeah. I'm just wondering, so, you know, our typical, many of us might have bought a perfume from one of those big, big name brands. Um, what, what's the what, what's the what's the real difference there? Are they is there a lot of exploitation going on in those supply chains, or, or kind of horrendously low wages being paid? Um, or what's you know do do you know kind of like any of the sort of difference in in wage potential between workers in your typical your Gucci perfume? <laughs> well, so so we source so we so we work through a company called called IFF International Fragrance and Flavors, mm -hmm. um, which is which is a huge company uh, 100 and some years old um, and it's known to be to source sustainably so you know for, for so all of our ingredients are sourced in a sustainable way according to mm -hmm. IFF standards yeah. um, and then in Morocco they meet you know they do meet their paid fair wages uh, yep. the supplier Les Aromes de Maroc Mm -hmm. um, and that supplier, you know, they supply to the Gucci perfume, supply to everyone around the world. Uh, the problem is just that they really have access only to seasonal work. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so we're, we're just going to qu quickly switch over to um, get a bit of interaction from the uh, from the audience that we're all dialed in here, which we're going to release a, a poll. Because we'd love to hear a little bit m more about what you think when it comes to uh, beauty, kind of what what sort of social impact are you most concerned about i guess like you know if if you were uh, if you would think about the sort of negativity potentially behind beauty supply chains like what what would most concern you um as a shopper um so that, that should be popping up on your screen now so we can get a bit more feedback from you guys um as to what what matters to you um, but then, for me what's that wages yeah agreed that's def definitely a, <laughs> a big one, isn't it? Well, let's let's have a, a chat and see see what the, uh, the the group says. So then, what about what about um, something's very dear to my heart? What about communicating uh, the impact you're having, you know, versus uh, other brands in the space, or or how how are you finding that? Are you are you seeing that? Um, I mean, you guys have always done a great job sharing your stories already and and showing the initiatives um, behind your brands. Like, how how's that process been? And are you thinking? Are you seeing a trend in the beauty industry for, for more kind of initiatives like this and, and openness about supply chains? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, you know, I, I, and, and, you know, like organizations like platforms like Provenance uh, are raising that awareness, you know, uh, um, and upping, upping the, uh, raising the bar. Uh, yeah. But yes, you know, yeah. right from clients who come forth and ask these questions to stockists who ask questions uh, to this and overall, I think in the last, what it's just been what five seven years there's been a paradigm shift yeah and it, i agree and, with you. And, yeah and honestly and i see green beauty green you know clean beauty becoming mainstream yeah. uh i think it's uh it's just the way forward yeah I agree i think to uh, speak to that a little bit further because there were two questions in there really one was about communicating um and and messaging and Kavita, you know, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on that as well, because this is something that in all honesty, I would say, Sonne Jardin, we really struggle with because trying to communicate um, that we're a socially conscious brand, that we have a unique model, um, you know, the beyond sustainability model, and that it's also luxury, you know, that yeah. fusion, how do you communicate that on social media and yeah. uh, on the shelf, you know, in a store, I think yeah getting better at it but it's it's really been it's been a challenge because um it, it because it's two different stories and uh, visually they're two different stories so mm. that that has been hard um but we're, we're working on that and i think also as you said kavita this paradigm shift that is that's occurring that you know is palpable um, you know, now I'm grateful because some of the words, you know, that maybe we understood a few years ago, or maybe concepts that we understood a few years ago, didn't have words attached to them yet, like circular economy. Uh, yeah. and now it's much easier for us to communicate, um, yeah. to communicate what we're doing because now people understand kind of these buzzwords. And then I guess lastly, to your point about, 
you know, retailers and seeing further engagement from clients um, and Kavita, I would imagine that you've had the same experience. For us, absolutely. So we launched in 2017 and, you know, we were just kind of knocking on every door and, you know, seeing if we could get into these retailers. And um, in 2018, there was really this great shift where, where retailers started coming to us because they were interested right. in having sustainable brands. So uh, I have a lot of admiration, Jesse, for what you do with provenance because it's the first into exactly what, what the, um, what the social impact work is, you know, and, and what the added ethical value to brands is when they make that claim. So um, it's, an, it's an exciting time. Absolutely. No, I, I agree. And I, you know, I've been passionate about this stuff for a long time, but I've, I've really seen that sort of shift, like rise out of the sea, like a wave in front of me. And yeah. I feel like, okay, it's yeah. actually here now um, for a long but time. You know, just to intervene. <laughs> Just to interject there, you know, Amy, it's 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 heartening for me to hear that uh, it, it's echoing my uh, you know challenges. I thought it was just unique to um, a luxury brand coming out of perhaps you know Asia or India, more so India, you know, where luxury is not okay. It's handcraft and in some flea market, mm. you know, a uh, uh, handcraft and. Uh, organic and ethical and all that, you know, that, you know, luxury and um, uh, handmade or handcrafted uh, is not mutually exclusive, you know, aesthetics right. and yeah. uh, ethics don't have to be mutually exclusive. And Absolutely. I thought I was the only one right. struggling with no. that. that <laughs> no, I mean, we're, we're amassing you all together so we can fight it because it's, there needs to be, the shift is happening, yeah. but the communications challenge is still yeah very much in play and we, we recognize that. Yeah. I'm gonna jump yeah. right over to some, so we've had some great questions coming in from, from the audience, even though I can, can think of a million more questions to ask you guys. Um, we've got one that's come in, uh, says both, both brands sound amazing in goals and achievements, um, but I'd love to know what challenging decisions you've had to make from a social impact versus business perspective, um, or if you've had to compromise along the way. Oh yeah, you know, uh, you um, as as you go, you know, along the way, you um, you you are you have to you have to make a decision. You know, uh, do do I compromise on quality, and do I say no? It's okay. You know, I am going to. Uh, so, for example, our rose essential oil comes from the Himalayas, right? Uh, there's only so much the uh, uh, distance, the small batch distillery, there's only so much they can produce and the cost is very high. So do you say, you know, am I going to continue giving them, you know, those prices? The prices go up every year, right? Am I going to do that? I'm going to look for another supplier, a middleman or a trader who gives you, and you make that decision. It's a conscious decision that you make Absolutely. and you say, no, I'm going to continue to support the small businesses and support these uh, um, community-based organizations that we're working with. The challenges are there on a daily basis. It's the choices we make. Absolutely, I agree. Sticking to the integrity of what you're trying to do. Yes. Sometimes yes. versus the business, imper the business imperatives is a yeah. daily challenge. Yeah. Amy, it how about you? Challenges, compromises? Yes, yes. Um, challenge, you know, tick every single box in every category, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, of a challenge specific to social impact and compromises that we may have had to make, um, I would say that that relates actually more to packaging and the bottling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of our women in Morocco, I don't feel like we've had to make any compromises with them. Uh, yeah. We do. We want to replicate this model in other regions of the world where we harvest our flowers from. So India is where we'd like to go next. Um, but we have to compromise that initiative because we're a small brand. We're a tiny little team. We don't have the bandwidth to go in there right now and, and re replicate the model globally as we'd like to. Hopefully we will as we grow. But we definitely have had to make compromises um, in terms of packaging because, Interesting. you know, there's the MOQs that you have to meet. And uh, so, for example, you know, our glass bottle, it's a stock bottle. Um, it's made from 30% recycled materials, which is the highest amount of recycled materials you can get for a stock bottle. Mm -hmm. But if we were a bigger brand, we could have a custom made bottle that's fully from recycled materials. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Or when we start mm -hmm. off, you know, and it's really been an evolution. And I think, you know, one of the words that mentioned earlier about integrity, 
uh, you know, I feel like we're always led by that and we're always evolving and refining. Um, so with packaging, you know, when we started off again, you know, we had more packaging than we really should have had, uh, but we wanted it to be convey that it was luxury. Uh, and then we Absolutely. got, to your point earlier, Kavita, you know, then we got feedback from some of our customers saying, you're a socially conscious brand, and yet there's all of yeah. the excess packaging. So, so we minimize the packaging. Tough though, because um, once they know the brand, fine, then they can criticize you. But before, you know that's the thing that caught their eye. So it's a tough yeah. it's a, I think packaging is a really tough one. I really do. Especially, especially with perfume, I believe. Really difficult. I'm, I'm conscious is. of time. Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump in and, and just say for, for those of you that do have to hop off, because we're at the half an hour and I know some of you are using this to break up your busy work from home schedules. Uh, yeah, if you do have to leave us here, um, thank you so much for joining and we will be hosting another Providence Live um, on another Wednesday, but even on the 13th of May, 5pm. Uh, so really excited to join you guys then. Um, however, we've got a couple more questions that are great. Um, so if you can hang around, Stick around, and I believe Kavita and Amy, you've got a few more minutes, right? So we can dig into some of the other ones. Absolutely. Actually, we've got a great question in from uh, one of the audience that actually really speaks to this point, but goes a bit further, which is talking about scale. So, mm -hmm. so I'll just read out this question here. So it says, "Hello, uh, thanks for this opportunity for the conversation. Um, do you think sustainable and ethical business models, such as the ones you've both started, are scalable to become big market leaders and compete with the big brands?" Um, or, or what are the main challenges that you see to growth? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first on that. Backward integration. Because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I'm always asked this question, oh, you know, uh, you're handcrafted, how will you scale up? You know, it's not a scalable business. And for the, for the first four years, I was like, mm, yeah, that's right, you know. Mm. But no, now I have a completely different different perspective on it mm -hmm. having done this you know having uh, uh like living breathing eating sleeping everything pure earth you know 24 7 mm -hmm. i have a different answer to this now india and i'm speaking in the context of my brand in india india is largely an agrarian economy even today and most of the world when it comes to ingredients comes to india yeah. so when it comes to scalability I believe it is absolutely possible, and I say it with such conviction, having spent this time doing, doing you know, what I do, that yes, you know, it is possible to be scalable and go mainstream with uh, not just my brand, but all brands, like even with Sana Jardin, you know, you can get scalable. Uh, the challenges are being able to, and like earlier I was saying, you know, with argan oil, for example, or, you know, uh, what, what is happening in Morocco is it's wonderful the way they have organized it. But if we are able to organize in these remote areas and work mm -hmm. with farmers and producer groups in a way where, uh, you know, you give them microcredit financing, for instance, so that they are, yeah. uh, uh, they have income security uh, come harvest season, and then they can go in into the forest. So like we work with the forestry department and the indigenous tribes have recorded rights to pick non-timber forest produce. So these mm -hmm. women say, we can do more, please. You know, we yep. can do more, you can pick more. And we make sure that it's sustainable while harvesting. We don't pluck from the roots, you know, it's the yep. berries and the So there is scalability like how, <laughs> but you know, you need governmental support, you need, yes. uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it takes a village. It takes more than and the village. market to shift to support this, right? Because you know you, you do need the business model to support this. And I, I agree. I, I think the, the, the wave there. of the market is coming, but you do need the mass market to shift in order to to make a business model like this work as well. I think uh, or just be less greedy there. on profits. I guess that's the other thing. <laughs> the other method. <laughs> Amy, yeah. how about you? Sorry, I cut you off talking about packaging, which I hopefully would be solved at scale. <laughs> Any uh, any other barriers to scaling your um, that model? Well, it's fine. So to answer that question, so I do think that this is something that is scalable. I think, for example, from my perspective, um, you know, we're a tiny little brand. We have six people on our team. Um, we're pretty new. You know, we launched two and a half years ago. If we had more bandwidth if we ha and we have investors um if we had more funds we would absolutely be able to replicate mm -hmm. models yeah so, yeah so for us it's really i don't think that the i don't think that the problem is 
whether or not a model can be replicated and scaled, I think it can be. I think it's a matter of resources. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and do you have yeah. desire for scale, both of you? Is that some, something you, when you founded the business, did you want to create like a fashion yeah. house size organization or like? Yeah, global domination. Because there were a billion <laughs> people, yeah, sorry, more than a yeah. billion people. And there is so much we can do, so much to be done. One lifetime is not enough. <laughs> I One lifetime is not enough. I, I, I understand. Um, for me, absolutely, I want to scale and grow. And when, when I started it, um, really the motivating force, the overarching force, and it still is the case, is to whatever happens with the business, um, is to really illustrate the thought that we can use luxury business to drive social change if we're creative with our use of waste. So if, it's, <laughs> so if it's Baba Jordan or if it's another company that's doing it, you know, I want to be able to create an alternative business model that's used in different industries and show that it can be a win-win for everyone. Um, so that, you know, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's my overarching vision. In order to do that, you know, we have to scale Sana Jardin, the business. I always say, you know, it's like operating two businesses. We have the perfume company, Sana Jardin, and then we have the social impact side. So in order for us as a small brand to do that, we have to increase our Sana Jardin sales globally. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The more you sell, the more you can impact social change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And do you think you will maintain your uh, your commitment to the social impact, even if you were a huge brand? And I know that's easy to say because personally, I believe both of you would, but thinking about uh, the conflicts that come with shareholders and, you know, ha having having to be accountable to uh, a, a, a board of shareholders that are looking for profit, like, do you, do you think there's a way really to have social enterprise or you know, business for good really at scale? Like, do you think that's really possible? Yeah, you know, when I started Pure Earth, I was very inspired by a case study of this brand called Jaipur Rugs. I think almost every, mm -hmm. you know, rug, rugs around the world come from them. I believe they engaged with 30,000 villages. Villages. Wow. Okay. Wow. And, uh, and it's a social villages. enterprise. <laughs> and what a successful model it is. Very, very, you know, inspiring. Amazing. Very inspiring. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, therein lies the answer. Yeah. It's real. It can happen. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. Good to know. Um, okay, I'm just going to look if there's any other questions. Oh, we've got a new one that's come in. So you both said you're struggling with what to focus on with regards to communication, either the premium or the sustainable aspect of the brand. Um, love, this person would love to hear more about what you've done so far. Uh, what would you recommend? Um, and this is, uh, yeah, he, he's acknowledging that it's something that most sustainable brands struggle with. So yeah, what have you done so far? What would you recommend for, for other brands? You must be disciplined and you must never lose focus. If you're a luxury brand, don't ever, I mean, you need to be very disciplined with, okay, if, if this is your brand positioning, if this is how your, you know, your brand identity, don't lose it, you know, so continue with it. Uh, you need to be very consistent. Uh, if you yeah. are a luxury brand and but you're communicating something, and you know there's a dip uh, with uh, certain aspects of the brand, then there is that disconnect, and people can pick up on it. You know, yeah. so if you are saying you're a luxury brand, right from your packaging uh, to your bottling to your ingredients, it needs to it needs to you know, and people impute quality. So um, you know, it, that has to be communicated. Um, that makes uh, sense. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, keeping that discipline you know if you're a luxury brand you keep to that discipline your your uh, the the so if you're doing a photo shoot or if you're doing your packaging how your outer packaging your boxes are you know uh it should be consistent throughout mm -hmm. that's what i absolutely. think absolutely amy I, you know as i mentioned earlier we we struggle with this this is a challenge um so so i think the ways that we and I would, I, I think that we are, we have um, evolved the last couple of years and I'm proud of where we're at right now. Um, but I'm sure there's still a lot of room for growth, but our formula right now is 
really to communicate our story, our values, our unique DNA through social media. And I would say um, on a granular level, I would say probably one out of every four posts has something to do with our beyond sustainability yeah. model. Maybe one out of every five. Our marketing mm -hmm. manager might think I'm really wrong, but it, I think that it's about that. Um, and and then also you know on our website trying to make it very clear what the story is um we have imagery of women in morocco we have image we have aspirational imagery of you know women who use the perfumes we have we have a very um high profile glamorous people who who are influencers for us because they like the brand we don't pay them um and and then also in our newsletter so communicating our story in our newsletter so i guess it's just, just it's it's the tempo and the frequency of what we communicate mm -hmm. how much we communicate that. so i would say the balance is probably 70 30 you know mm -hmm. 70 product yeah, related 70 yeah. percent yeah. aspirational kind of makes sense and 30 yeah. percent uh, impact but the other great thing that's happening right now is that there's so many influencers out there who are known for um believing in sustainable products so yeah. when we're able to partner with people like like them that's already a shortcut there's already an understanding yeah. that that person yeah. is going to be promoting something that's sustainable so that helps with our communication thank, thank goodness influencers they're starting to be influencers yeah. for good because it was a spiral of craziness i'm um, someone just asked them um, how provenance works with companies in order to um, communicate transparency. So just quickly, I guess, for some of you that are online that are, uh, are new to our community, um, so Provenance works with businesses to help them be more transparent. We've come from a background in the food and drinks industry, only started working in beauty last year. So we're, we're complete rookies when it comes to the beauty industry. Um, but saw a lot of parallels between what we've been doing in the food and drinks industry, the kind of farm to fork movement and opening up data about um, where, where suppliers are, the key bits of impact that relate to a product. Uh, and indeed even the full journey behind a product that's in your hand. Um, and yeah, we've been slowly applying that to beauty. And I'm actually really impressed with um, how much this kind of trend for more transparency and, and social and environmental impact is kind of sweeping over beauty uh, in, a, in a, kind of a, a kind of a kind of pace that feels a lot more rapid than the, the food industry, which seemed to have been quite slow and, and, and grown obviously a lot. But beauty it feels like it's a, a, a really becoming very rapid and at the moment a lot of what we're doing with beauty brands is helping them support the claims they're making and and back yeah. up that data with with more integrity and and increasingly talking about opening up more information on ingredients as well so that people can really yes. see the impact for, behind those mm -hmm. i'm very conscious of time um it's been so fantastic to chat with you guys i could just carry on um i'm going to just give the results of the poll so that you can all find out what people care about it will not be a surprise that unfair wages at 42 percent is the thing that people are most concerned about but very closely followed by dangerous working conditions at 33 percent so interesting um so thank you all for participating in that um so we're just going to wrap up now just maybe just a quick final takeaway let's relate back to the crazy world that we're in right now with covid um and just thinking positively um what would you want the world to look like on the other side anything any any change little change you'd like to see in the world a post-covid world you know, there's a saying in Sanskrit, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, which means we are the world is one family. And COVID-19 oh, has connected us in ways unimaginable. We realize we are part of that same consciousness, you know? Totally agree. Amy, take away for a post-COVID world. Avita, how can I say it better than how it was said I in know. Sanskrit? That's exactly <laughs> I how I feel. I, hope, I, hope each yeah. I, hope, yeah. I totally agree. Global family, what a wonderful note to end yeah, on. So yeah. thank you all ever so much for joining us for, for, for this week's Provenance Live. A reminder again, we'll be back here on the uh, 13th of May, 5 p.m. For, for another insightful session looking at other in, in, insights from social and environmental impact for around our community. Um, yeah, be, be sure if, you, if you're interested in joining that one to make sure you register ahead of time so we can send you a, a link. Um, and yeah, please, please do jump over to social and continue the conversation. Like I'm, I'm sort of Amy and Kavita, we've, we've posted links to, uh, to, to both of their brands. They'd love to, to chat with you over on, uh, on it.
Instagram so you can find out more about what they're doing. And, and us at Provenance would also love to hear from you if you've got questions or, or ideas for things we should be discussing. So thank you so much, Amy. Thank you so much, Kavita. Part of our global family. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you all. So much. Have a fantastic evening. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.